Hi, everybody, and welcome to another CaddyCube Tuesdays. I'm Jason Barnard, and I'm here with Chris Kochak, which I said correctly because he just cheated and told me how to say his name. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. A quick hello, and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Chris Kochak. Beautiful. And we'll be speaking about... Thank you very much. And how to incorporate insights into your branding campaigns. Now, branding campaigns, I understand. Insights doesn't mean anything on its own, in my opinion. And I really want you to explain that once we get started. What do you mean by insights? Because is it insights into business? Is it insights into the campaign? Is it insights into branding? Is it insights into my audience? Or is it all of them? These are my ideas, and I've got no idea what I'm talking about. Chris is going to explain. Uh, lovely to have you here. And as we start, as always, with the brand set, CaliCube obsessed by Google search results for brand names and personal brand names, i.e. your own name. Chris Ko Kochak is an author. Google right now is looking for authors because it wants to find who is writing and creating the content in order to be able to understand, is this person a credible source for the information they're providing? So you are actually an author. But a lot of other people in the world who are, for example, SEO consultants have now been tagged by Google as an author, not because they are an author, but because Google wants to find authors to understand who is authoritative. Number two is that your description in your knowledge panel over there on the right-hand side comes from Google Books because you've got two books, one of which is called Any Insights Yet, and the other of which is written far too small for me to be able to read it. What's it called? It's the Practical Pocket Guide to Account Planning. Brilliant. So you have two books. Your description comes from Google Books, and that's typically something very difficult to change because it's a dominant source that Google will use over and above any other source. And in order to change it, you need to change your description in Google Books, and you can't actually go into Google Books and edit it. So that's a super tricky problem if you wanted to change that from the founder and CEO of Gallant Branding to Chris Kocek is an author. Um, something, of course, we can do at CaddyCube. We figure this out, and that's what we do all day long, every day, is figure out how to change these representations of your brand on Google. And you can see below, claim this knowledge panel. Uh, you have your entity home of above, chriscocheck.com. Click on that, claim it through Search Console. I would advise you to do that so that somebody else doesn't claim it. And also, when you suggest changes to this knowledge panel, the Google system will put to you to the top of the list, the top of the queue, so that your requests as owner of the knowledge panel are prioritized over everybody else's. Did you know any of that? I didn't know about the knowledge panel at all. And I also didn't know that you couldn't um, uh, easily change your information with Google. Um, but it's good to know that you guys know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and you can only do it indirectly. The algorithms are the final decision maker. Even mm -hmm. if somebody at Google can change it for you when you ask them, if the algorithms disagree, they will change it back. So at the end of the day, we're playing uh, a, a game with the algorithms in order to change the knowledge panels but with secondary sources. You can't do it directly. And that's hugely interesting. And I could talk about it all day, but that's not why we're here. We're here with Chris Kochak so that you can explain to me, first of all, what our insights and secondly, how to incorporate them into my branding campaigns. So can we start with what are insights? Absolutely. Well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by saying what an insight is not. Ooh. Because, because there are a lot of people who use this word. And in the beginning of the book, I talk about how it's used and abused so much. So, um, so an book. insight, there it is. There's the cover of the book, Bright Yellow to Get Your Attention. Um, Except for the people listening on audio who don't see the bright yellow or the book, but <laughs> they can now know that we had the book on screen. Carry Just on. imagine a beautiful sunflower yellow. Um, so, so an insight is not a data point. It's not a trend, oh. which is really just a collection of data points. It's not uh, a human truth, but it's related to a human truth. It's not just a personal observation, it's, and it's certainly not a headline or a tagline or anything like that. So those are the things that it's not. But the thing is, in most um, you know, business meetings, people will say, hey, you know, I've got an insight, when they really should just say, I have a data point. I have an interesting data point that maybe nobody else is familiar with. And so that 
um, right there starts to create this proliferation of insights where everybody's saying, I've got insights, I've got insights. No, you've got data points and they're good data points. But I think that an insight is more complicated than that. I think it's actually, my definition is a, um, it's a metaphor really. So it's, it's that a, an insight is a constellation of data points, observations, and human truths coming together all in one oh. package to solve a problem, inspire a new product design, possibly inspire a new business model, or an innovative marketing campaign um, that will give your brand a long-term advantage. So it's a mashup of all those things. Right, now here's a question, it's philosophical rather than anything else. An insight has to necessarily solve a problem or can we just have insights because it's interesting? Well, that's that's a great question. My my director at at BBDO New York years ago, Tracy Lovat, she would say um, she would say there are insights that are interesting and insights that are useful. <laughs> yes, and I go for the interesting ones a lot of the time, and my team say, "Forget it, Jason. We need to focus on the useful ones." Yep, and she said, "You know, we're more interested in the useful ones over here." She was British, so um, oh, so I like yeah. The British accent. Thank you. My mum was British, so. Oh, brilliant. And you've got the British with the T missing, which is delightful. <laughs> I switch back and forth. So anyway, sorry, carry on. We're looking for the useful ones. I mean, from my perspective, I get hugely overexcited by the interesting ones. And it's these rabbit holes you go down. And I find it incredibly interesting. You get to the bottom of the rabbit hole and you say, look at all this and show it. And that's just, this is what I've been doing for years. And then people say, that's interesting, but how does it help me? And the answer is it doesn't. I just mm. found it interesting. And that's fairly pointless. So that is always the challenge because businesses, they're on a tight deadline always. And so you've got to deliver something that's going to be actionable very quickly or as quickly as you can. And that was one of the reasons why I wrote the book was to create a series of techniques that people can use um, that are used consistently. Uh, when you look at some of the best campaigns, the most effective campaigns, there actually there is a method to the madness. There's a pattern underneath what they're doing they may not even recognize those techniques themselves no sorry i, I didn't mean to cut you off I, this is me getting interested in the topic the more yeah. we talk and when you say branding campaigns what do you mean by branding campaigns we've got paid campaigns we've got pr campaigns we've got seo campaigns all of these could be considered to be branding campaigns what in particular are you talking about here so i think that um they are all part of branding. Like you said, search, social, all of those uh, help influence and shape the perception of the brand. Um, but sometimes when you, like, for example, Airbnb, I think back in 2019, said they were going to start cutting money from performance marketing and they were going to invest more in branding oh, campaigns. And so wow. that branding campaign focus is around, you know, be becoming synonymous with the category that you become the number one thing in the category so when i say um you know vacation home the first mm. thing that comes to your mind is airbnb that's their hope of course if i say smartphone the first thing that should come to your mind for for the sake of apple is iphone i'm sure the yeah. samsung people will not like that but but i know that like so that's the branding campaign trying to get your your brand out there um I actually have a really interesting example um, from years ago with at Gallant Branding. Uh, we had this automatic ball launcher company called iFetch. Um, oh, no, like relation, no relation to, to iPhone or anything like that. Um, but they, they got into trouble for that? They didn't, actually. They managed to oh. survive. Um, but it was an automatic ball launcher for little dogs that really love playing fetch. But the thing is, nobody knew to look for a search term like automatic ball launcher for dogs because nobody could have imagined that such a device existed. And so because of that, we needed to do some things to elevate their brand, to make it for branded search purposes so that it would show up in front of people and then they would start to say, oh, that's that iFetch thing, right? Because again, automatic ball launcher, if you did a search for that, probably even if you did a search for it today, um, mm -hmm. You know, at the time, this is almost 10 years ago, but at the time, automatic ball launcher would just serve up, uh, you know, launching ball mechanisms for tennis, you know? Right. No, 100%. So, and, and, sorry, and that, that actually brings me, and I've now realized why Maria invited you onto the show, is because CaliCube 
sell services that nobody knows exist and nobody knows they need. And we have a huge education problem. And we've been working a great deal on educating our audience and saying to them, this is something you need, even though you don't know it, which is hugely difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And we may well have done better to just focus on the brand, get people used to the brand in the context of digital marketing, then explain it to them. Mm -hmm. Would that have been a good strategy? Possibly. That could certainly uh, work and be interesting. I'm sure you've heard about the MailChimp campaign where they used a bunch of, you know, weird words like whale, whale blimp and things like that. Yeah. They put all these billboards out, uh, you know, in various cities that looked like, you know, different, different words. And, and people would go search whale blimp and they would say, did you mean whale, uh, MailChimp? And they drove them to MailChimp mm -hmm. that way. Very clever campaign. No. Yeah, no, no, no. And you said you've surely heard of it. And the answer is no, I haven't, which shows oh. just how, how, well, just how much information there is in the world and that yes. there is a limit to how much we can actually hear about and know. Of and course. that is something I hadn't heard of because I haven't been hanging out with people like you. That's about <laughs> to change. Um, so carry on, carry on. Well, no, so it's just a brilliant, that, that's kind of that, that intersection between brand and, you know, PPC where mm -hmm. very clever, where they're trying to create this ecosystem. Again, lots of different, um, there were different phrases besides, you know, whale blimp, uh, but sounded like MailChimp. And, and that drove people uh, into the MailChimp ecosystem. So it's, it's part brand and it's part search. It's this whole idea of, of tapping into the, did you mean XYZ. So that's one thing for, for CaliCube. Um, you could do, you know, maybe something along, along those lines. Um, there are lots of different ways to get people's attention. And um, oh, just sorry, just coming back to the did you mean? In fact, yeah. a lot of our clients come to us asking us to get rid of that on their brand name search mm. because Google's thinking they mean something else and that pushes people away from the company. Oh, yeah, so yeah. they ask us to educate Google about their existence so that it stops saying did you mean, which is. Oh, okay completely the opposite of what MailChimp does which or did which is for me hugely hugely interesting but i interrupted you and you were about to move on to the next point oh no i mean so so with calicube you know one of the things i'm going to butcher the quote so i probably shouldn't even try but it's something along the lines of you want to meet up with somebody wherever their need already is so yes. and that's tricky that's tricky when you say hey we're solving problems people didn't even know they had so i guess in your case it's about finding an adjacent problem that they do know they have mm -hmm. and then pivoting to something else. I mean, a lot of times at Gallant, when, when we have clients, they come in and say, we need help with social media. That'll be a, a, a big thing that they'll, they'll often start with. Or we need help, you know, we need a, a new website or something like that. And, and we start talking to them. We say, well, who are your customers? Well, any, you know, people 18 to 65 plus, men, women, pretty much everybody. Yep. And you say, well, actually, so before we start with anything here with paid search or paid social, I think we really need to identify who your customers are. So, so sometimes you get them in the door, but then you, you, but through asking them questions, you find out that actually they've got some bigger problems here, here, and here. And you're going to need to solve those first before you can tackle the other things. Right. Okay. We've actually gone a little bit off topic here, but yeah, um, that was hugely interesting and hugely helpful. So I'm getting some free advice from Chris uh, for CaliCube, which is great. So the team will now listen to this and pull this into our strategy beautifully. But we're talking about insights in the branding campaigns and the, uh, the, 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 what you talk about the idea of an aha moment. So mm. an insight is an aha moment. And I have lots of those and I go, aha. And that's been happening more for the useful aha moments rather than the interesting aha moments. And I think that's the, we're heading in the right direction. But from an aha moment, what happens? I sit here as a business leader and I say, I've got this insight, it's an aha moment, what do I do with it? Yeah, so that's a great question. So that gets into part four in the book, which is about how do you sell an insight? Which is so we've very skipped important. parts two and three. We've, we've skipped parts two and three. Four. Part four. How do you sell an insight? Well, you've got to you've got to set up the story, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to meet the person, whoever you're trying to convince, that this is a critical aha moment that you need to know for your brand. You've got to be able to get their attention, hold their attention, and take them to the inevitable conclusion. So that by the time you get to your insight, it's almost rolling off of their tongue. 
as well. So I often, I, I like to point out that, you know, one thing that you can do is study um, movies with great plot twists because oh. what they're doing in movies like The Sixth Sense, The Matrix, Knives Out, any of those films, Gone Girl, they're planting these little seeds throughout the film, usually very early on or halfway through the film, that actually have the answer right there. E easy example, I'm assuming everybody's seen The Matrix, even though it came back came out in 1999, but there's a scene halfway through the film where Neo says, are you saying I can dodge bullets? And Morpheus says, no, Neo, I'm saying that when you really understand what you're capable of, I'm paraphrasing, you won't have to, right? Ooh. Right. Okay. And and that is then leads to the climactic scene when he actually stops the bullets from hitting him. He's no longer dodging them. He realizes that he's in the matrix and it is a world completely framed by his mind and he can actually just put his hand up and stop them. So those little bits are usually sprinkled throughout movies, murder mysteries, things like that with big plot twists um, in the sixth sense. Should I reveal? Should I reveal the big thing about the yeah, sixth sense? Go ahead. Because okay. I don't remember. Okay. So, you know, Haley Joe Osmond's character says, I see dead people. And he's talking to Bruce Willis. The catch is Bruce Willis didn't know he was dead the entire film. Right. Right. He finds that I've out. I've seen the film, but I've completely forgotten. You yeah. just, you just given me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> so he finds out at the end of the film that he's been dead. And of course the audience gasps. And then we go back and we, we rewatch the film to see all mm. those instances where it's like, Oh my gosh, it was right in front of us the whole time. And that's the, that's the tricky nature about, about an insight. And that's why I love the constellation metaphor, because you can look up at the night sky, if you're in a fairly dark area and see, you know, these stars, but you may not know that which stars connect to make the constellation. So usually it requires somebody else to point it out to you, give it a name, articulate it. And then from that point on, you see it. So it's, it's hiding in plain sight. And you've just basically walked me through this interview by me now asking when you're talking about joining the dots, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it's all about, to me, finding the patterns and connecting the dots between these different things. So you had asked earlier on, you know, is it about business building insights? Is it about campaign insights? It's really all of the above. There are some people out there, for example, the people who innovated around Slack or Airbnb, they knew there were certain trends out in the world that were happening, right? They, they, they connected the dots in a very interesting way for Airbnb. They saw there's excessive housing inventory you know, that people have bought because they were going to flip it, couldn't flip it, they're sitting on it. Okay, so excess housing inventory. There was, at the time of Airbnb's, you know, rise, there was the whole sharing economy. Mm -hmm. There was the tech trend of high-end photography with smartphones. You didn't need necessarily, you know, Canon or Nikon, you know, big cameras, you can just use your phone. There's also um, millennials' desire for unique non-corporate destinations. So there were a lot of different, different, stars in the sky, a lot of different dots to be connected. People knew about those trends, but it was only really the, the founders of Airbnb and Verbo and whatever you guys have out there, perhaps, uh, where people said, hey, th this is actually a business idea. If we just connect mm -hmm. the dots properly and have the right search engine or the right review system and, and you know, ease, we, we can make a business out of this. And then they just completely disrupted their category. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you, and you actually talk about creating a new category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they what did. we've done at Catacube is created a new category, but now we're sitting in the category on our own mm -hmm. and nobody's looking for the category, which is the problem we talked about earlier on. But at least we don't have any competitors, which is delightful. That's good. And if you catch on, I guarantee you, then people will start to run to wherever you are. So, yeah. Um, well, it's starting to happen and I think it's going to take off in 2024. But back, back to this topic, which is, it's pretty easy to say these guys join the dots, create the business um, and wonderful genius. And I sit here looking at whatever's sitting in front of me, uh, the data, the ideas, the information, the people. How do I join the dots to make some kind of sense of it that actually gives me that useful insight? Yeah, so that's the that's the huge work. question. That's a huge question, and it is the work. Uh, it is the work of connecting the dots because sometimes one of the things I like to say is that um, 
we're, we're, we're pattern recognition machines. Humans are pattern recognition machines. That's, that's what we do. It's kind of led, you know, our evolution and our survival is, is dependent on, on being able to connect the dots and say, oh, if I do this, this is what happens. If I don't do this, this is what happens. So we're pattern recognition machines. Sometimes our software is a little faulty and we connect dots in ways that, that don't necessarily add up to anything. So you have to be, you, you start to learn through the process of doing which dots matter, which dots don't. Again, going back to stars in the sky, there are so many stars in the sky, but there are certain stars that form constellations and give you your true north or give you the direction that you're looking for. So it, it comes with practice and understanding which things mean the most metrics that matter and paying attention to those. So I, I don't have an easy answer for you on that, which dots to connect. I'd have to sit and look at the dots or to use another analogy, look at the tea leaves with you and organize them in such a way um, that it, it gives direction. Right. But in the book, what I assume is that you explain the techniques that people can use to do that. Um, and so theoretically, one can do it oneself if one reads the book. But it's actually similar to come to you and ask you to do it, which is very similar to what I did with my book, The Fundamentals of Brand Search for Business, is I explain everything. I say, here's a system for doing all of this stuff. But the reading the tea leaves is lovely because that's what I do with a brand SERP. I can explain to you all day long all of the different things you can look at in a brand SERP, but it comes down to years and years and years of experience of different scenarios to be able to look at a brand SERP and say, this is how it all joins together. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about the joining the dots. I've been talking about tea leaves. Is it, am I right in that kind of similarity between the way we've approached this? There's definitely a similarity. I mean, the techniques in the book, there's there's seven of them. Um, you know, just some of my favorites oh, are do like... You wanna, do you want to list them? Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, keep asking why, keep asking why. So when when you look at how somebody's doing something today or the way that your business is doing something today, you got to ask, why are we doing it this way? You know? Mm. And and I know a lot of people think, well, you know, that's just a question that a three-year-old or a five-year-old would ask. They always ask why, why, why. But it is that process of digging deeper and deeper and deeper with the whys um, mm. that you can land on some sort of innovation. You know, one of my favorite examples I reference in the book is um, apparently the daughter uh, of, uh, I'm forgetting his name, but asked, why do we have to wait for a picture? And that was the question that sparked the Polaroid camera for being invented. Mr. Polaroid is his name. No, Mr. Polaroid. I, th I think it was, it, 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 didn't it come from Kodak? Yes. Yes, I believe it did. So, but that question, why do we have to wait for a picture? Well, that's a great question. Maybe we don't. Maybe if we can come up with a new technology, we don't have to. I mean, and so that question is now, to me, that's the question that's, that's driving so many innovations. It's always the question for innovation. So why do I have to go to a car dealership to buy a car? Hmm. You don't anymore. I don't know if Carvana is out where you are, but we've got this company out here called Carvana, which will just deliver a car to your front doorstep. And you can take it for a test drive for a period of time, things like that. So, so keep asking why. That's a technique that will get you underneath the way we've always done things. Right. And the, the, for me, there are two things there. Number one is keep asking why about everything that's happening. But mm -hmm. also keep asking why about the same thing. Because the first answer you give to why is often a kind of, oh, I haven't really thought about this, but here's a general reason. Now you can stop asking that question, which is why yeah. children keep saying, but why? Mm -hmm. And that's a sign that you haven't explained it properly. And when you haven't explained it properly, it means you haven't thought it through. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And that's what makes it so challenging in boardrooms. Because, because again, if you are supposed to be the expert on the brand or you're mm. supposed to be the expert on the category and someone is asking you these why questions, it threatens your identity as the expert. So you have to have a culture of trust to be able to keep asking why. Yeah, which is lovely as well, because the, there's a lady who works with us called Sarah Mokonsaye, and I love talking to her because I talk about all the stuff I know, like the back of my hand. And then she suddenly asked me that question, but why? Or justify that. And then I give her this kind of fluffy answer that just kind of said, you know, let's not talk about that. And then she just insists and insists and insists until I've actually given a proper answer that makes sense. And that's hugely powerful, and a lot of people don't do it. Yeah, well, it's oh, a thank challenge. You, Sarah. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a challenging question. And again, in certain environments and contexts, people don't want to be challenged because it threatens their authority. And, and so that's understandable. But if you have a culture 
that says, hey, we're here looking for the best answers. My answer or the answer that's been used for the past 10 years may not be the best answer anymore because there are new technologies. People are thinking about things differently. So those are all different reasons why you want to keep coming back to why. Um, some of the other techniques are create conflict. So when you create Ooh. conflict in a focus group or maybe in a, in a campaign format, what conflict does is it, is it gets to the emotional heart of the matter. So if you create two polarities, just using the word or, do you like this or this? Which one's best, this or this? Which is worst, this or this? You're going to get heated um, ideas. There, there's no shortage of opinions on the internet um, and in social media. So creating conflict can be a great way to unveil uh, an insight or, again, a breadcrumb trail that leads you to an insight. Again, these are techniques that are meant to get you closer to an insight, but you still have to connect the dots and articulate them. But by creating conflict in in a focus group setting or among your customers to kind of see what they feel about something, um, you're going to get some very interesting answers that are not guarded, that are not even rational or thinking. They're going to be emotional answers. And emotion is where advertising usually wants to go. Right. Makes total sense. What's number three? Number three is reframing the question. So a lot of times we ask a question a certain way, and um, and maybe if we just reframed it a little bit, just a slight shift in the way we ask the question, um, you know, people will uh, open up in a totally different way and give you brand new ideas. And a, an example of this, we were working with a, a quick service restaurant a while ago, and we were talking with people and somebody said, you know, I like to eat well. We were talking about healthy food. And they said, I like to eat well. And they were interchanging that word with with healthy back and forth, back and forth. Um, or we had been talking about healthy food and they kept talking about the word well. So you have to be a really active listener. And I said, you know, we've been talking about healthy food. You keep using this word well. What's the difference between healthy and well? Can you elaborate on that for me? And they said, well, healthy food is kind of like um, food without soul. <laughs> or it, it makes me think of cardboard or it makes me think of, I'm not really going to enjoy this. You know, that's mm. healthy food. That's like naked chicken and brown rice. But eating well, in, it allows me to feel satisfied. I can eat well, but still feel like I'm eating healthy. So there are certain foods that satisfy your taste buds and your health needs, and you feel like you're eating well. Now, it also implies a little bit of decadence as well, so you have to tread carefully in that area. But, but so reframing the question, or I guess what we were doing there is we were interrogating language. Right. Mm. So that's another technique is interrogate language. What do you mean by that? What do you really mean when you say this word? So interrogating it, language is a powerful. Is that number four? That's number five. Language. I jumped to number five, which is interrogating language. Number four is looking at the periphery. Oh, right. So, so just like with stars, if you try to look at certain stars in the sky, you look directly at them, you can't see them because probably your eyeball has been so desensitized by all the lights mm -hmm. we have. Um, but if you look away, then you'll see that star shining in the corner of your eye, right? You ever had that experience? No, but I'll believe you. Okay. So, but it's, it's <laughs> a lot of times with, with problems, it's like, if you look directly at it, you're not going to be able to solve mm. it. But when you look to the side, to the left or to the right, there are clues on the left or the right that you may have been myopic about before. And now you see, oh my gosh, this is the thing that's really influencing what's going on here. So one of the examples I give in the book is around dog shelters or animal shelters where people were surrendering their pets to the animal shelter. And, and um, it, it was really an issue of poverty. It was like they, they just don't have the money to, to afford taking care of the pet with the vet bills and the food and everything else. And so then it became uh, a mechanism to say, okay, well, I think we need to if they want to keep the dog, they really do want to keep the dog. We have to solve this through a different angle, you know? So that's one example. Um, the example, another example I give in the book is, is around carpets. You've got a stain, a stain resistant carpet that you want to talk about. So you want to talk to people about their stains on their carpets. Mm, yes and no. You want to go a few concentric circles outside of stains. You want to talk about 
why is it so important to you to remove that stain before your parents come over or your in-laws come over? Hmm. What's really going on there? Well, there's shame, there's guilt, Hmm. there's feelings of inadequacy, you know? And when you get to emotion once again, again, you want to get to emotions because that's, we're emotional creatures and, Hmm. and the best campaigns tap into a feeling not just your rational brain. And that is where a lot of times, you know, with search, it's like, no, it's just the direct. Let's just, people are searching for this. And so, so that there is a place for that, but that's why with brand campaigns, you know, you you just want to hit that, those heartstrings. Right. Yeah. Brand campaigns hit the heartstrings sometimes, or when somebody's ready to buy, it's straight to the goal with something incredibly pragmatic. So we've got six and seven to get in in the next couple of minutes. Yeah. Uh, the sixth one is find the contradiction. So, um, you know, people contradict themselves all the time or, or society sends mixed messages to us all the time. So the easy campaign there is the dove campaign for real beauty. On the one hand, you have people saying, you know, Hey, it's what's inside that counts, you know, your personality, who you are, that's what matters most. And on the other hand, you've got many societal messages saying, nope, you've got to curl and powder and nip and tuck and do all these different things to look a certain way. Beauty is only skin deep. And so mm-hmm. that's a that's a cultural contradiction that can often lead to a cultural tension. Um, an interesting, I mean, there are so many tension or contentious issues in society right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there always are. Um, and so if a brand can tap into those, I know it can be risky territory, but if you yeah. can tap into those, um, then you can create the big tent for the conversation. And that's exactly what Dove did. Um, and the, number seven. And number seven is ask what if more often, which is almost, uh, it's, a, it's a cousin perhaps or a sibling to asking why. But yeah. when you ask what if, what you're doing is you're opening up your imagination toward innovation. So uh, so the, the, why, the why is incredibly pragmatic and what's happening right now what's the Mm -hmm. current situation and Mm -hmm. what if is the imagination where could we be exactly why is looking at the past why have we always done it that way what if we did it this way but it's also you can flip it on its head just a little bit which is what if and i love this example from from nissan they asked the question what if everything in the world ran on gas they were promoting the electric leaf at the time which was their electric car Mm. Um, so, so they show all these scenarios where, um, you know, a a cell phone is running on gasoline or a water cooler is running on gasoline, Mm -hmm. these things that of course run on batteries. But when you see that juxtaposition, you realize how crazy and absurd it is. And then they pay it off with, then again, what if everything didn't, including our cars? Mm -hmm. So what if our cars didn't run on gas and run on electric instead? So such a, such a clever campaign and a, a good twist, which is what, comedians do all the time. So if you're last, last tip, if you're looking for the the breadcrumb trail toward an insight, pay close attention to comedians because they mm. pay attention carefully to the absurdity of our behavior as humans. Brilliant. That, that's absolutely delightful and wonderful. And I, I love the fact that we had a lovely chat beforehand, and then went through the seven points. I've written them all down. I'm going to study that and think about it tonight. And I will have an aha moment at three o'clock in the morning. Um, thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely brilliant. There's one last question, uh, which usually I put on screen. I don't have it today, but what we're looking to do is how does all this fit into branded search? Great You've question. Got a minute to tell me. <clears throat> okay, so let's use interrogating language. If you interrogate language um, and and how people are using certain words, and you're talking to people, you've got to talk to people, and then you learn from them what it is they're really thinking about or how they're going about doing things, then you can write blog posts or you can do various things that tie into the branded search piece. Or if you create conflict, if you say, <clears throat> excuse me, if you say, um, you know, this is better than this or, or best versus worst, you create those comparisons. People are often looking for comparisons online, right? So using the create conflict um, mode of insight building can actually be a very effective technique also in, in search and branded search. Well, brilliant. Yeah. And, and, and triggering the my service versus the other service, which actually 
signifies as, uh, to Google as well, and that's an important part of it, is the volume of search is hugely important to Google's understanding of that, of the importance of that concept or that idea to people. And if you can create con conflict of two particular brands, it's obvious to Google in particular that those two brands are fighting and are fighting for supremacy, which naturally brings them top of mind for Google and therefore more likely to be recommended by Google to the subset of its users who are your audience. Thank you so much, Chris. That was absolutely brilliant. We're now going to pass the baton uh, to next week's guest, uh, Jill Lublin. Publicity, get known everywhere with guerrilla publicity. That's going to be hugely interesting because I get the feeling guerrilla publicity is free publicity. Could you possibly pass the baton, Chris? Absolutely. Jill is an expert in, in guerrilla publicity, and there's no doubt that uh, good guerrilla marketing, good guerrilla publicity will help you with branded search. So stay tuned for Jill Lublin. Brilliant. Guerrilla publicity. Good guerrilla publicity is what we're looking for. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for watching. A quick goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure. CaliCube. It's all about your brand, SERP.